Hello, my name is Wesley Bellman, and I'm a systems engineer at Palo Alto Networks, covering federal customers. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to use a restricted EDL with your next generation firewall. EDL stands for External Dynamic List, and this is a feature in your next generation firewall, uh, which I will be covering extensively today. I will talk about four things today. First, I will explain what an external dynamic list is. I will talk about why a customer might want to create a restricted external dynamic list. And then I'll show how to set up access to a restricted external dynamic list on your next generation firewall. I won't be talking about how to actually build a restricted external dynamic list as this is a topic for web server administrators and not for firewall administrators. However, if you have questions about my setup using Nginx, I'd be happy to answer those. Just put the questions in the comments or reach out to me. Finally, I will demonstrate blocking of x.com using a restricted external dynamic list. For the first two questions, I'll just answer those here abstractly. So first, what is an external dynamic list? So an external dynamic list is a web page, and I will show one such web page in a minute, um, which lists several IPs or URLs or domain names which your firewall can access and it can use that list to build rules from. This may be a deny rule or a drop rule, or it might actually be an allow rule. So there might be an external dynamic list that has good URLs or IPs that you want to actually make sure that people in your network have access to. However, uh, EDLs are often used by th threat research groups to actually determine URLs or IPs which are being used by threat actors in order to try to exploit your network. And so oftentimes EDLs are used for drop rules, deny rules, so that you can stay up to date with the threat using resources provided by those threat research groups such as Palo Alto Networks Unit 42. So you might be wondering if these threat research groups are publishing EDLs publicly that anyone can access using just an HTTP web page instead of an HTTPS web page, why would you create a restricted EDL? What's the point in restricting access to your external dynamic list? And this largely applies to federal customers. Many federal customers want to not release the list of IPs or URLs that they might be blocking because they don't want adversaries to know that they have discovered that they are using that IP uh, for malicious purposes. And then that threat actor might realize that they've been discovered and they might switch the IP that they use to one that's not being tracked by a federal customer. So that's why federal customers might want to create a restricted EDL. Now, one way that federal customers do this currently, which is very inefficient, and I experienced this personally when I was active duty Air Force, is they send out cyber tasking orders over email, which then individual firewall administrators have to go into the firewall and create a drop rule for that specific IP or URL going inbound and outbound from the network. This is very inefficient. It uses a lot of uh, man hours to go in and read the CTO and find all the URLs and IPs and then create the rules and commit them. And it also just creates a bunch of messy rules in your firewall. So you end up with a, a lot of rules that are difficult to manage. You also end up with rules that you then don't know when they're retired versus if you have an EDL, which is centrally managed, you know when those IPs, the, the organization that releases that CTO knows how long that IP is being used by that threat actor and then can go uh, take it off of the list once that IP has been uh, defanged and the uh, threat actor no longer has access to that IP. They no, they no longer have that lease on that IP. So I believe that creating a restricted EDL is a much better way to do this because it still does uh, ensure that the access to that list is protected, that a threat actor will not be able to access it. However, it's much more efficient and the different firewalls can all access that EDL and they can have it update regularly. So the other issue with the CTO process is that a person has to go in and do it and usually they're provided 24 hours from when the CTO is released. However, if the 
IP or URLs put into the EDL. The EDL, um, as we'll see in the demo, can update every five minutes. So that's much faster. So there's many benefits to creating a restricted EDL as compared to sending out IPs or URLs to block or email and then manually putting those in rules. Finally, I will proceed to the two demos that I have today. So first demo is simply setting up access to the restricted EDL on your next generation firewall. So I will start by opening the EDL here. So I have created an EDL at edl.paloaltoairforce.com slash index.txt. So you see here we're using what's called HTTP basic authentication. Now this is username and password authentication. However, because we want to control this list, I highly recommend you see this password not as a password, but as a key which means that it should be long, it should be randomly generated using a cryptographically secure algorithm, and it should be rotated frequently. Also, uh, this key should not be saved anywhere um, in some sort of a text file. It should only be uh, saved on the actual firewall, which is going to use it. And then if the key is lost, rather than uh, recovering the key, you should generate a new key. For this implementation, the way that I have decided to create my username is to actually use the serial number from the firewall. You can do this however you want in your implementation. However, what I like about using the serial number as the username is that when I see who has accessed this EDL, I can see that it's which firewall has actually accessed it. So that just helps me with non-repudiation. And now I will go get the password. And I input the password. Another note on security is you will note that I'm not signing in from the same IP that the firewall is. I'm signing in just from my computer here. What that means is that this uh, access to this is not IP restricted. However, I do recommend adding IP restrictions. You can do that in the actual web server as well as if you put this behind a firewall, which I recommend you do, you can ensure that it's only being accessed from the firewall that uh, needs to update it. So those are some additional security measures which I recommend you implement in a, in a real world implementation of a restricted EDL in which I will implement um, after this demonstration. However, for demonstration purposes, and I also recommend for testing purposes when you're initially setting this up, do leave it open, um, make sure that everything works, and then add the IP restrictions after you're sure that, the, um, that your firewall is able to access the list using the proper username and password. So now I will actually go into the Palo Alto Next Generation Firewall. So the first place I want you to take a look at for extended dynamic lists is objects. If you go into the objects tab, you will see here one of the objects is going to be external dynamic lists. So this is the external dynamic list that I've created for this demonstration. So as you'll see, that's the same URL which I've typed here. Now let's briefly look at this. So when you configure this, you'll need to make sure that you have the source and then you'll need a certificate profile. I will get specifically into this certificate profile because this is very important that you configure this correctly. Um, if you don't configure this correctly, you'll not be able to access your external dynamic list. Once you add a certificate profile, this menu will appear to add your username and password. Again, I have here the username is the serial number of this firewall. And then uh, the password is the same password that I put into there. Again, you can check for updates every five minutes. You can do hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at every five minutes. That's uh, relatively rapid. So that's really all you need. Uh, this test source URL does not work uh, if you're using authentication. Um, so if you hit test source URL here and, and it will say that it, it access error, that's normal. So don't, don't think that that means that you can't access the URL. I will show you how to ensure that you are correctly accessing this URL in a second. Um, however, this is everything that you need to configure. So now let's look at certificates because that's going to be very important to make sure that that is um, configured correctly. You go to device and then under certificate management, you hit certificates. And this is where all of your certificates are that your next generation firewall has access to. So actually let's go back to the external dynamic list and I will click the lock icon in Chrome, hit connection to secure. Certificate is valid, um, details. So here you can see the certificate hierarchy of this specific external dynamic list. So this has 
the Internet Security Research Group, uh, Route X1, and the R3 um, Intermediate CA before it gets to the actual certificate that secures this website. Now, in order for your next generation firewall to be able to access this, you need to have these two certificates imported into your next generation firewall. So as you can see, I have both of these imported here, and I actually have the EDL certificate as well. This is not necessary, but I do have this imported in my firewall. And you can see these are both marked as certificate authorities. It's very important that you have both of these here in this certificates menu. These are just the certificates, not the private keys. As you can see, private key is not checked here. This, this private key, I don't have this private key here either. Um, so this firewall does not have access to private key. It just needs the actual certificate. Since these are publicly available certificates, um, you can find these particular certificates on the internet. Um, however, uh, whatever your certificate management solution is within your network, you'll just need to make sure that those actual certificates are uploaded to this firewall before it can reach out to that EDL. So then you can create a certificate profile. And as you can see, I created a certificate profile here called EDL certificate. Again, I didn't need to import the EDL certificate itself, just the root certificate authority and the intermediate certificate authority as well. And you don't need to configure anything else. And then we'll just briefly go back here. As you can see, certificate profile is that EDL certificate profile. It lists all my certificate profiles here, as I mentioned before. So now I'll show you how to check if it's working. So you'll want to go to monitor. If you check system and you can see here there is an EDL log. It's a informational log general it says there's no changes. So it was not not updated at the road end. So this this last update, nothing changed in the EDL. We will change the EDL for the purposes of this demonstration. You'll see an error when it uh, so here when it's instead of saying not updated, it'll say there will be an error that it can't access the uh, EDL on the remote end. And then that's how you know that, that you have an issue with your configuration. Over here, we can see everything is good. So now we'll proceed to the final part of the demo in which I will show you how to use the EDL to block a specific IP. So I will change to monitoring traffic logs and I will monitor the client list VPN activity associated with me as the user. And then I will go to my client list VPN portal I will type in the application http colon slash slash x.com. So this is just x. Then I will go back here to monitor. And now you can see that traffic to x.com. This is a specific port 80 traffic here. Um, you can click it. You can see that was just, just right now. I just sent that request to x.com. Um, it's still marked as financial services. Uh, for those who don't know, x.com was a financial services website that was started by Elon Musk. And then he repurchased the URL and just put X there. The main thing I want to capture is this IP right here. So we're going to assume that threat actor somehow gets hold of this IP and we want to add it to our external dynamic list. So we've copied that IP. And now we'll go back to the EDL. I will quickly add this to this EDL. Okay, I have added that IP to this EDL. So let me refresh. And here you can see it's now been added to the top of the EDL. So if we go back to our Palo Alto Networks Next Generation Firewall, we can go to Objects and go into External Dynamic Lists. We'll go back to this external dynamic list and we'll see list entries. You can see that it is now in the list here. Um, it was not there before. And if we go back to the, the system logs, you can see that the EDL was fetched. So five minutes before this it was not updated remote end, right? No changes to list file. And then five minutes later at 1457, the logs are a little bit different, right? It says it fetched job done, it's refreshed, um, and, and then the refresh job was a success. So it actually changed the EDL, right? So now if we look at our policies, um, let's check out this policy right here. 
So this policy blocks uh, blocks IPs and restricted lists. It actually blocks outbound uh, IPs. And the way that it does that is any source to the destination, that same US Air Force demo EDL, which I created in, in the objects tab. So this is how you can create a policy to block IPs within a specific EDL. And if you go to actions, you'll see that it does drop those packets. So, and it will log at session end. So I hit okay. So now if I go to back to monitor and I hit traffic. So if you remember, there was this traffic to this IP. I will now filter it on traffic to this IP here. We'll add this filter so it'll be a lot less entries. You'll see I accessed it uh, once preparing for this demo. Now it was accessed again during the demo. And now we will try to access it again. So I will close this tab. So the x.com URL is in this browser's cache right now. So the way that I need to test this is to actually open a new, I'll open a new incognito tab, and then I will go to my client list VPN. I will log in as me. And then here I will go to the x.com URL. And here you can see that it's timing out, it's going slow. It's exactly what you would expect with a drop packet. And I will go here to monitor. You can see it's been dropping, it's dropping the packet with exactly the rule that I had on top, the demonstration of block IPs and restricted lists. So you'll see that this list, which again is protected here and restricted, um, is in fact allowing this uh, block to occur and it's uh, updating this block uh, very rapidly. Uh, every five minutes it updates. So that's my demonstration. I showed you what an EDL is, um, why a customer might want to create a restricted EDL. That is one that is uh, protected not only with a key, but also um, by IP and uh, making sure that it's only being accessed from an approved source. And then I showed you how to set up access to a restricted EDL on your next generation firewall. And then finally, I demonstrated how to use an EDL to block x.com. I updated a specific restricted EDL with the IP of x.com and showed that it did indeed block. Please let me know what you think of this in the comments. And if you have any questions about external dynamic lists or Palo Alto products, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the video.